if you would, please, in your copy of the scriptures, turn to Mark's Gospel, chapter 1. If you don't have a Bible with you, I don't know if we brought any out here today. Sorry if we didn't. If we Normally, we would love to give you a copy that you can use and even have. Um, but I would just encourage you to listen well or scoot up close to someone who does have a Bible. They won't mind. That's me speaking for them. I was told, strongly encouraged, urged, forced... Um, to not wear a suit jacket today. I'm not going to name names. It was one of the elders, and he was singing with me. And uh, he said, and he said, don't do it. It's going to be warm and all this. I prefer to wear a suit jacket. But I understand that uh, I'm the new guy. This, this ties into the sermon, I promise. That I'm the new guy, that I, um, I don't have the historical uh, clout here yet. And Don's got some positional authority and I and I submitted to that and he was you know Don he was not scary about it at all and I'm grateful for his urging because I would be dying if I was wearing a suit jacket right now but I chose to follow after that but authority is an unavoidable fixture in life isn't it I mean it's unavoidable we may not think that way regularly but it is true so much operates and works and moves forward because of authority structures in our lives. Sorry, I'm moving that microphone. Hope that's not distracting. You need someone with authority, with the right authority, to do things like unlock certain doors. It requires authority to enter and search a property, uh, for another example. Even at the dinner table, the words, um, eat all your vegetables, they mean more coming from dad than they do coming from sister because dad has authority where sister does not authority is present in the largest of situations like the authority to declare war on a nation and authority is present in the smallest of situations like unlocking a phone with your thumbprint and we're aware that there is currently and always has been for that matter historically an anti-authority sentiment among people countless sinful rebellions, revolutions, and anti-authority uh, movements have taken place throughout history and have demonstrated this. The current trend, for example, of people trying to recategorize themselves in various ways is a rebellion, ultimately a rebellion against authority. You can't tell me who I am. I, I will determine who I am. I will tell you what or who I am meant to be, how I am meant to live out my identity. So, so to, t to tell somebody that there is a God who made them, a God to whom they are accountable, and that he has already determined who you are, what your station in life will be. Oh, that is among the worst of crimes we could commit today. We can't stand the thought that we were made to live according to somebody else's will and agenda. We can't stand that. Unfortunately for us rebels, though, authority is really built into the fabric of the cosmos. It is unavoid unavoidable, and, and this is not new. It may be taking on new forms, but I don't know if there was a quite another time in history that looked exactly like this one, but the hearts of people have always been the same. The hearts of people have not changed. I, I can think of a time very early on in the story of the human race when rebellion against authority changed everything. Eve took and she ate and she gave to her husband who was with her and he ate. And so we have all inherited this anti-authority sentiment from our first parents. Now, we're okay with people when they have no authority over us. We can think of different figures in our life. I, I love the ice cream truck driver. He's great, he gives me what I want, and he doesn't tell me what to do. Uh, what, what a wonderful relationship we have. <laughs> but, but what about when someone shows up and makes a big claim to authority 
if an officer from the Royal Canadian Mounted Police trotted in via horseback right now and started trying to arrest some of us, I think we would kindly and rightly laugh him off the property and back up north because he has no authority here. He doesn't have any. We need not take him seriously. But what about someone a bit more historic? You know where this is going. It's going toward our text today in Mark 1, verses 21 through 28. What about Jesus? Was Jesus an authoritative figure? Do we think about him as authoritative, or, or, or was, he, was he harmless? This is a real question in people's minds, in a lot of people's minds. We love the idea of a harmless Jesus, don't we? Uh, I, I want a Jesus who really just loves me for me. He doesn't challenge my thoughts. He doesn't challenge my habits. He just wants to be my buddy at all costs. Yeah, yes, he's God, but you know, he doesn't really act like it. He, he doesn't want me to feel awkward. He would never flaunt his authority. He, he's way too humble for that. Is that the Jesus of Scripture and of history? A, a harmless, neutral figure who tiptoes around our feelings and who avoids challenging our paradigms and ideas? That, that's our question today. It's, it's this, for those of you who are note takers, here's the question we would seek to answer today. Did Jesus come with authority? Did he come with authority? And so much hinges on the answer to that question, doesn't it? It does, because think about this. What if he came with no authority? If he came with no authority, what, what if his agenda was simply to hang around and be on standby to offer wisdom and hugs? That's, that's all he could do. He, he was a well-meaning teacher. You know, the world is fine with that Jesus, which should tell us something. The world is fine with that Jesus. He, he's welcome as long as he is tame. I want... A Jesus who does not threaten my autonomy. A Jesus who leaves my lifestyle and my choices alone. I want a Jesus who I can bring into my house on my terms and I give him the attic bedroom and I can call on him when I want, but I can also send him away when he gets a little bit too personal. I want a Jesus who is in charge on Sunday when I'm around other Christians, but then who hands over his badge Monday through Saturday. Or... On the other hand, if Jesus did come with authority, if Jesus did come with authority, this is a very different story. Jesus announced, you remember his central, central message of his ministry, Jesus announced that the kingdom of God has arrived. That's his central message. It is a huge claim, and it is a claim that understandably would need to be backed up. It would need to be supported. You can almost hear people saying, says who? If Jesus came with authority, then his words matter. If he came with authority, his commands matter. If he came with authority, then we also are confronted with the arrival of this kingdom. We are beckoned required to listen and to heed his words and to take him as he is and not how we want him to be. If Jesus came with authority, then everything in our lives ought to be disrupted. And I will say at the onset, oh, Lord, may our lives be disrupted by the authoritative Christ. This text will show us a Messiah who is not harmless. He's not neutral. No, he has authority that people like you and me have to reckon with. We have to reckon with this. So friend, just as we go through this, consider your own life. Consider your own heart as we look at this passage today. Do you worship Jesus as the one having all authority, as scripture and history both attest? Or do you think of Jesus as something less? Let's take a look. And I'm going to read the text in its entirety right now. Mark 1. Verses 21 through 28 read like this. And they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. 
And immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent, and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. And they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. May God always bless the reading and the hearing of his holy word. Did Jesus come with authority? I will contend, based on what we just read, that yes, he did. First, we see that he has authority over God's word. He has authority over God's word. He's now in Capernaum. This is a town on the northwest corner of the Sea of Galilee. This is where some of the 12 disciples were from, and this would be the headquarters for much of Jesus' uh, ministry out of Capernaum. Um, and they are there on the Sabbath. They are there on Saturday. This is the day of rest under the Old Covenant. And in Capernaum, on a Saturday, where should an Israelite be? They ought to be down at the synagogue learning the scriptures. And that is exactly where Jesus and his disciples went. Now, the synagogue was probably the most uh, large building in town. And it is likely, we don't know, it is likely that this very synagogue has been unearthed in Capernaum, which is pretty spectacular. In fact, there's a church in Capernaum from the uh, Byzantine Empire that has been built over the top of the foundation of a common house believed to be Peter's house. So there's a lot of New Testament history centered around Capernaum, and it starts with this story right here. Jesus entered into the synagogue and he began to teach. Now, how does that work? Traveling rabbis were often afforded the privilege of teaching in any synagogue they entered, so that this would not have been odd. Here's, a, here's Jesus, he's a recognized rabbi, and he's given the privilege of teaching. So, Jesus would have stood to read a portion of the law, and then a portion of the prophets, and then he would have sat in what is called the Moses seat, a place from which he would um, expound the scriptures and teach the people, explain them, um, and apply them to life. And he did this. And when he did it, something happened. Now, we don't know what passage he was teaching. The text simply does not tell us, and so we conclude that that's not actually the most important detail of this story. We don't know what he was teaching, but what is relevant is how Jesus was teaching the people. Verse 22 tells us they were astonished at his teaching. Not because he found some secret Bible verse they'd never read before. Not because he introduced some sort of brand new section to the scriptures. Nothing like that. They were astonished because he taught them as one who had authority. They were moved. They were rattled. They sat up straight in their seats because there's something different about this rabbi. We, we sit here every Sabbath listening and learning and memorizing, but we have not heard anything quite like this before. This is different. And when we put our finger on the difference, according to the text, the difference is this teaching has authority. And we should wonder about this a little bit. What, what do they mean by that? What do they mean by authority? It, uh, was, was Jesus simply a profound orator? Uh, maybe he pounded the pulpit, or he spoke eloquently, he was something of a convincing salesman. What do they mean, authority? Now, Mark does not r record this, but before Jesus taught in Capernaum, he taught somewhere else. You may know this. It's recorded in Luke's gospel. He taught in the synagogue in Nazareth, his hometown. That's before he came to Capernaum. And he was rejected there. He was rejected in his hometown. But we can get a little bit more insight into kind of how Jesus taught when we look at what happened when he taught in Nazareth, according to Luke. So this is in Luke chapter 4, for your own reference, in verses 16 through 21. I'm going to read it to you. You can try to flip over there quickly if you'd like. But this is Luke 4, 16 through 21. And Jesus came in, into Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. 
and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and he gave it back to the attendant, the text says, and he sat down and the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Because normally that text was skipped over because it was reserved for Messiah. Jesus turned right to it and read it. And verse 21 says, he told them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Here is what was profound about Jesus' teaching. Please don't miss this. The promises of God found in the scriptures would find their greatest meaning in him and in his work. The, the one reading it. He's the point of what he's reading. Whatever passage he taught in Capernaum, Jesus taught in a way to show, to prove, that the promises of God were coming true in him, specifically. He says, oh wow, look at these amazing promises God has made to our fathers for ages past. They're preparing you for the culmination of God's revelation. They're preparing you for me. That was what was central to Jesus' teaching. Paul says, similarly, in 2 Corinthians Chapter 1, Paul says that all the promises of God find their yes in Jesus. That's a pretty straightforward statement. This is also why when Jesus uh, was resurrected and was walking with the two disciples on the road to Emmaus in Luke 24, he conf they were confused, they were despairing, but he confronted their confusion. He confronted their despair in this way. This is what he said to them in Luke 24. He said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And verse 27 of Luke 24, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning what? the things concerning himself. Let me make a very plain statement. The Old Testament scriptures show us Jesus and his work to redeem sinners. They, they have a punchline and it's him. But the Old Testament is not simply fun stories. It is not simply uh, um, um, a godless morality. It's not Aesop's fables. The Old Testament are meant to, is meant to prepare people for the Messiah, for Jesus and what he would do. He claimed to be the point of them. The scriptures also were authored by Jesus because of the divine inspiration involved with the human authors. So when, <laughs> so when God reads a book about God and by God, of course there's going to be authority connected to that. This is like the greatest example of a meet the author moment at a bookstore. He can talk about the book he wrote. He didn't only write it, but it's about him. Of course he's going to speak with authority. This, that was a long way of emphasizing that Jesus came with authority over God's word as both the author of it and the chief subject of it. For a rabbi to come in and teach the word of God in a way that demonstrates authority over what is being read. read the, the guy, this is a tremendous, scandalous claim to authority. This man speaks for God. He has interpretive insight to God's will and plans and purposes. No other teacher can claim this. And it means that when he speaks about the things of God, what God has done and how people ought to live in relation to that God, when Jesus talks, we ought to listen because he has this authority. So please consider the powerful image that this text gives us. The, the, think about this. In this passage, the word of God is not only um, inspired ink on a page. John says that the word became flesh and dwelt among us and even taught a Bible lesson in Capernaum. So you, we have the living word reading the written word in one scene. It's amazing. And here's why this matters for us. 
if Jesus holds this authority, if Jesus has authority over God's revelation to people, we cannot escape our complete and dire need for him. If he has authority over the scriptures, we don't need to just own a Bible that sits on a shelf somewhere. We need Jesus because it's his book, because he has authority over it. You, you, you cannot take God at his word and reject the son, Jesus, at the same time. You can't do that. That's a complete contradiction. You cannot submit to the written word without bowing to the living word, who is the point of the written word. You cannot love the wisdom sayings in the Proverbs and yet reject the high point of redemption. Jesus Christ, crucified, buried, raised again, and reigning on high, calling people to himself. If the Bible has any bearing on our lives, we must understand Jesus and his saving work as the center of it, as the point of it. Friends, owning a Bible means nothing. Like, just that alone. Well, I I have a Bible. Great. That means nothing. Even reading it occasionally will get you nowhere. You know what? I even memorized a couple popular verses when I was a kid. Well, that alone brings no bearing on your uh, immortal soul. It does not. A person is only saved and transformed when he or she comes to see Jesus as the glorious Savior he truly is, who has all authority over God's revelation and as the supreme center of that revelation. Do not make the mistake of believing or teaching to others that you can have a Christless Christianity. You cannot. You can have Christ or you can have chaos. There's nothing in between. Go to the scriptures and go to them often. Yes, this is God's sweet gift to us. But go to them always with their irreplaceable center in view. And the irreplaceable center is the authoritative Christ. Jesus had authority over God's word, which he clearly demonstrated. But secondly, he had authority over God's enemies. Oh, the two tremendous demonstrations of authority over God's word first and over God's enemies. So Jesus is up front. He is teaching. It's a marvelous moment. But there's an interruption. A man with an unclean spirit was in the synagogue, we read. And he wasn't sitting there politely listening. That's not the sort of thing that an unclean spirit would tend to do. I doubt he gave anything in the offering or brought a dish to the potluck. This, um, this was an interrupting, unclean spirit. And what does he say? Verse 24. What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Now, I think there is a basic question that needs to be answered here because we are going to see similar situations to this throughout the rest of Mark's gospel. Thirteen times, in fact, there are interactions with unclean spirits. So a good question is, what is that? (laughs) What is an unclean spirit? Are we dealing with indigestion? Are we dealing with a case of the Mondays? Maybe this man was just generally moody. No. No, Jesus was dealing with a demon, or the way that this is worded, probably multiple demons. The term demon and unclean spirit are used interchangeably in the New Testament. We're talking about the same thing. So what is a demon? And you you think, come on, hurry hurry up and get this out of the way. We're not supposed to talk about stuff like this. A a, a demon is a little red guy with a pitchfork who gets into trouble, isn't he? No, I, I don't think so. I don't think so. I think we need to pause here for a moment, and lest you think we should skip over this, we cannot. Uh, There seems to be, I'm speaking very broadly here, there seems to be at best an ignorance, and at worst an unhealthy fear regarding talking about demons and Satan. Now why is that? Why is there a fear of that? Uh, um, Christians often don't like to talk about this. But church, I'm going to say that we must talk about it, if for no other reason than this. It's in the text. It's in the text 13 times in this shortest of gospel accounts alone. I think we would be wrong and negligent to skip over this. We have to talk about it because God has given it to us divinely and in his sovereign will. We in the West have 
lost much of a supernatural understanding of reality. I, I think that's just true. We want everything rational. We want everything in a nice box with a label on it so it can be filed neatly away and we can be in control. We, we have to understand everything. But the world is not like that. It is not like that in every way. We live in a supernatural world. If you need proof, I'll give you just a couple of them. Um, gravity exists. <laughs> Something is holding us to this surface. <laughs> so let's start there. The human heart keeps beating without anybody telling it to. I can't explain that. Or how about this? Um, just a small th uh, example. God created everything out of nothing. Can you think about that for a minute? An angel and Satan fought over Moses' body. I didn't read that on a weird fringe website that's in the book of Jude. A donkey talked. Enoch walked with God one minute and then was no more the next minute. What happened to Enoch? I don't know. We'll find out someday. I could go on. This is all, this is all from scripture. Reality is supernatural in our common understanding. And these folks in the synagogue understood that. And here's my proof for that. I want you to consider this. What were they shocked at? The fact that there's a man screaming with a demon in him or the fact that there was teaching with authority? <laughs> Think about that. They were shocked at the sound teaching. They weren't shocked at the man with the demon. Doesn't that tell us something? So what is a demon? What, what do we know? The Old Testament lays some groundwork. The New Testament fills things in a bit more. Here's what we know, and we, we have to hang our hat just on what we know. And where we don't know, we say, I don't know. But here's what we know. We know that God created more than what we see on a daily basis. We know that. God created beings in the heavenly realm. Scripture refers to things like a heavenly council and Passages like Jeremiah 23, 1 Kings, 1 Kings 22, Deuteronomy 32, and Psalm 82. Th these are all places I'd reference for that. Now, some of these beings, you can broadly refer to them as angels. I think that that's fine. They serve God in heaven. They, they do what is good. They serve God's will. They, they serve as his messengers. They protect. They carry out judgment like at Sodom and Gomorrah. They fight for God's people, like in the book of Daniel. Now, some of them, though, have rebelled and turned away from God. We know this as well, like the ones described in Jude and 2 Peter. They, they work against God, and they work against his intentions, hating mankind. We know that they have worked hard to manipulate the nations. We know that Israel sacrificed their children to demons, we're told in Psalms. I think Psalm 106. And when God sent the plagues to Egypt, he said it was to declare victory over the little g gods of Egypt. Not lifeless statues merely, but real entities. Not, not other gods like God Almighty. There are none. That is clear. But spiritual beings nonetheless that were worshipped in the place of God. The powers that really did turn the staffs of Pharaoh's magicians into snakes. There's more that could be said. But in short, demons are spiritual beings who are in league with Satan, their chief, and who are, oppo who are opposed to God's kingdom. They hate the image of God. And so they interfere with people and with the lives of people. Satan manipulated the weather in Job to bring a windstorm to kill Job's children. The demon in our text regularly afflicted this man. Another frequently threw the boy it was possessing into the water and into the fire. I know this is something of a long rabbit trail, but here, here is why it matters. These are the thugs who have been against God and against his agenda from ages old. These are the historic enemies of God. The demon speaks, and when he speaks, I'm going to use a theological term here, he starts uh, doing eschatology, which is the study of end times. The demon starts doing eschatology. Suddenly, this is an end times Bible study. He asks, have you come to destroy us? This demon knows what is in store for him someday. He knows what's coming for him and his counterparts. He knows what is going to happen. He knows that after centuries of deceit and control over the nations, God would begin to reverse things 
in his kingdom and by his king, reclaiming the nations to himself, disarming every rule and authority, and it would mean the certain and eventual end of Satan and his forces. The demon knew that, and he asked, is that time right now? But then the demon, who obviously has some good doctrine, moves on from eschatology, which is end times, to Christology, which is our understanding of God the Son. I know who you are. The Holy One of God. The, the, the people in the synagogue didn't quite get it yet, but the demon knew. I know who you are. Something about Jesus presence told him that perhaps it was his teaching with authority something let the demon know who was in the room we'll see something similar when jesus and the disciples go across the sea to the decapolis and the man full of demons comes running to meet him at the shore he knew who it was this demon is drawing on centuries of warfare, centuries of rebellion. So it's, it's kind of like when you think you're about to introduce someone to a new person and you say, oh, I, um, I see you know each other already. Yeah, you could say that. They go way back. They go way back. But it's a short conversation. Jesus says to him literally, be muzzled, shut up, and come out of him. And the demon throws a fit causes a scene the man screams and convulses and the demon comes out where he went who knows I'm, i don't know i am the first to say this is scary stuff this is horror movie stuff it convulsed him some translations say it tore at him he screamed and then it was gone and you can imagine the silence for that one moment before the first person spoke again so let me say this church this is scary stuff for the demon this is really scary stuff for the demon. 1 John 3, 8 says that Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. Ephesians 6 says this in verse 12, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Christ would disarm the rulers and authorities of this world, both seen and unseen. Colossians 2 says, this grand reversal of dominion over the nations began when Christ arrived on the scene. And here we see that first expression of his authority over them. If you need proof that the kingdom has come, here is one, Jesus, who proves it by expelling God's long-standing enemies with just a word. What more proof do we need? Here's a quote from an author, recently deceased author and scholar, actually, named Michael Heiser. He said this about this passage. He said, he said, it might sound hard to believe, but this event is the first time in the entire Bible that we read about a demon being cast out of a person, right here. He says, no such event is ever recorded in the Old Testament. The defeat of demons falling on the heels of Jesus' victory over Satan's temptations marks the beginning of the reestablishment of the kingdom of God. That's from Michael Heiser. Ch Church, it was a real bad time to be a demon in Galilee. Verse 28 says that word traveled fast among the people that Jesus was on the scene. You can bet word traveled twice as fast among the demons. I hope that both of these demonstrations of authority show us there is nothing neutral about Jesus. He came to challenge the people's understandings of how scripture would be fulfilled. He came to challenge the people's understanding of how God's enemies would be expelled. And he did these things naturally, clearly, and with ease because he is the king of the kingdom. He's the only one who could do what he did. What, what, what a powerful way to begin a public ministry. This grabbed the nation's attention. Does it grab yours? Because he hasn't changed. In fact, he's been exalted to the right hand of the Father and all authority has been given to him. If anything, there's been an increase in how magnificent he is as he's seen all over the world as glorious and his hard hearts are changed and are drawn to him. Do you see him that way? Because here's exciting news, his authority has not stopped. 
This, this wasn't like, okay, I got enough in me for one. No. His authority has not stopped. Still today, the enemies of God, both seen and unseen, flee before him. Still. Still today, Jesus works by his authority to bring the word of God to bear on human hearts and minds. People who have been in sin's long-standing grip find freedom and they find salvation when they come face to face with the gospel of Jesus, the only remedy to their own rebellion against God's authority. So church, as we end, hear this, please, for our own sakes and for the sake of all those who need salvation, can we please give people Jesus as he truly is? As he is. He is not one option among many like a booth set up at a festival. He is not neutral and benign, wanting more than anything to just respect our desires and paradigms. No. No. The Jesus of real history, the Jesus of the Bible, is the Son of God who came with authority. He is kind, don't get me wrong. He is merciful, he is patient, but he will challenge our thoughts, attitudes, choices, and lives. People have no need for a false Jesus that operates on their terms. That Jesus doesn't exist. There is no such Jesus. They need a king who alone is worthy of their allegiance. A king who speaks for God because he is God and a king who can vanquish the greatest of enemies, even the deepest sin within the human heart. Nothing else will do. Nothing else will do. And as we do take Jesus to the world, may we be filled with gratitude that Jesus not only came, but came with authority. Please bow your heads and pray with me. God in heaven, we thank you that Jesus is not timid that he is not powerless, uh, that he is not just a nice option for carnal wisdom. God, we thank you that when you sent Jesus, you, you, you named him king over the kingdom and eventually, one day, over all things, realized, celebrated, worshipped. God, we love you for that. So I pray that we would truly believe that ourselves. We would see Jesus as one who confronts our paradigms. We would see Jesus as one who does have all authority, and we would eagerly turn and bow the knee to him in all that we say and do. And I pray that this is the Jesus we would take to the world. Would you, would you burden us with that? Not to give them uh, a, a soft, watered-down version of the Christ, but the true authoritative version of the Christ, who does have all authority, who confronts our sin, and who can handle our sin and do away with it. His mercy is more. So God, I, I, I pray these things for this church and for everyone with whom we interact, a world that desperately needs to know uh, that there is a Redeemer who has been victorious. Would you please burden us with that message, and uh, would you please give us opportunity and courage to take it to those who need to hear it desperately. I ask this for the good of people and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, we're going to sing one more time in a moment. But first, I got to give a little plug for something. Um, do you remember when the Ethiopian was converted in the book of Acts? And he, and he came to see Christ as glorious? From the Old Testament, by the way. Do you remember what he asked immediately? Here is water. What keeps me from being baptized? Well, everybody, I can see it, you can't, but here is water. What keeps you from being baptized? Um, at Bayview Bible Church, uh, we believe in what is called credo baptism or believer's baptism. We believe that scripture teaches that when a hard heart is made soft, and when someone does see their sin and they realize their need for Jesus and they are truly changed, uh, to, their allegiance has changed to him. They have a desire to follow after him. They're, they're united to Christ. They're in union with Christ, as Romans 6 describes. When that happens, a Christian ought to be baptized um, in the water all the way under. I, this is, we look at the New Testament model. But I, I, I need, so a couple of things. If you profess Christ, 
If you say, yes, he is my king. Yes, I do want to follow him. Yes, he has my allegiance. Yes, I want to proclaim him. If Jesus Christ is your savior, and if you have turned to him and fully, fully trusting in him uh, for your salvation in this life and the next, if that's true, I'm going, to, I'm going to word this strongly. You ought to be baptized. And I don't say that on my authority. I have none. I see that as the complete uh, and clear teaching of Jesus himself in the New Testament. Christians ought to be baptized. You ought to be baptized, I would say, publicly, because it is meant to be a wonderful opportunity and moment, not just for you, but for your church family to celebrate the grace of God in your life with you. It is good for everybody. It is a proclamation and demonstration of the gospel. Romans 6 said, using uh, baptism as the illustration, we died with Christ, we were buried with Christ, and we will be raised with Christ. In other words, everything Jesus has done counts for his people. Baptism is a picture of that. Dying, being buried, being raised again that on that glorious uh, future day. So, when Jesus told the disciples as the last, last, his last words to them before he departed, uh, to go back to glory, um, to make disciples of the nations, doing two things, baptizing them and teaching them. We want to be faithful to that command of Jesus. We want to, we want to baptize Christians. I'll just put it that way. If you've been baptized as a, as a confessing Christian, there's no need to do it again. I'm not a tremendous fan of that. You know, I, I had a new epiphany, better get baptized again. I don't, I don't think so. I don't see that in scripture. But if you have not been baptized as a confessing Christian, I would say you ought to be. I'd like to invite you into a conversation with myself and with the elders to talk more about that. And we are having an outdoor church service in Farragut State Park on July 23rd, I believe. And we would love it if immediately, at part of the church service or immediately following, we, we marched on down to the water and were able to publicly uh, baptize people who are new creations in Christ. So if you've not been um you ought to be, and I want to talk about that. And I'm, I'm even talking to young people as well who truly do confess Christ and who are bearing fruit of repentance in their life. I don't know that there's a magic age we ought to wait to uh, and for that kid to reach until they ought to be baptized. I think we need to talk with them. We need to talk with the parents. And if there's reason to believe that their profession is true and there's fruit in their life, I would push for baptism. So if we're going to be Baptists, I think I said this in our meeting, for, if we're going to be Baptists, let's be Baptists. And um, that's not just because we're company men. That's because what we see scripture teaching. So um, it's a good thing and an important thing. And I want to invite you into that. And we'd love it if this happened um, not just during outdoor church services every, every uh, 23rd of July. We'd love this to be a regular part of our life as a church as people do come to true faith and repentance that they would be baptized uh, soon afterward. So I want to put that out there to you. If that ministers to you, or if that's speaking to your heart and you're thinking, yes, that is me, that ought to be me, I would love to talk to you about that more. With that said, I believe we're going to end with the singing of a song and a receiving of a benediction from the end of Jude's little epistle. So uh, for the sake of help with familiarity and because it's just a wonderful, wonderful song, we're going to sing All People That On Earth Do Dwell again um, from Psalm 100. I've already forgotten. What page that's on? Someone will find it. Four. Yes. Okay. Let's sing together, and after we finish singing, please remain standing for the benediction. All people that Oh, enter 
within his gates with joy, within his courts his praise proclaim, and thankful songs your tongues employ, oh bless and magnify his name. The last couple verses of Jude's short epistle read like this. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Have a great week, church.